What's going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Super Men's Comics, and we are back with that great market trend video where we're talking about three up, three down. We're giving you three up market trends and three down market trends in the comic book community, aren't we, Jack? Absolutely. And we're not just talking books this week, Brian. We're talking about true trends. We are seeing some things happen in the comic book market, both in the positive and the negative end that we want to talk about. We're getting into it right now, starting with the first one up. And we're talking about Kevin Eastman and Laird. This is a big one everyone might know about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin, but there's more symbolism there where we are getting that reunion with Eastman and Laird, aren't we? Absolutely, Brian. This cannot be really undersold. These are two men who created some of the most iconic characters in all of comic book history. Um, and beyond that, uh, an entire generation of children were raised on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And a lot of people may not be privy to their history, but this duo broke up some 20 plus years ago and very little contact between them over the years, if any at all. And the, the Netflix docu-series, The Toys That Made Us, actually got to document them reuniting for the first time after a number of years and kind of discussing that they would love to work together. And somewhere along the way, IDW made this happen and we're getting the last Ronin, which is kind of being advertised as the last Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles story we'll ever read. Three brothers are dead, one brother remains, and he carries the torch and the mantle for all of them. Um, Everybody's excited about this book. Major reader buzz for this. Lots, lots, lots of gorgeous exclusive variant covers. Our own channel sponsor, Frankie's Comics, has announced a Peach Momoko cover that is absolutely fire. So be sure to check out frankiescomics.com for that one. But this is another reason to be excited about comics right now, Brian, because this is just a feel-good story of two guys coming back together, uh, reuniting kind of the flame of the original Ninja Turtles. I have no doubt that even after a long hiatus of working together, these two are going to bring some magic on this series. This is one of the books that I'm the most excited to read in 2020. Yeah, it's great because we've got the original creative team, and then we got the creative team that's been with the book White Down with Tom Waltz in there as well, right? Absolutely. So the next one we're talking about on the three up is Joker. Joker is everywhere. We got Joker. We, we got Joker war going on. We got three Jokers. We just also found out that Joker is going to be the main villain in the new Batman movie trilogy. But no doubt, Joker is on the minds of a lot of people in comic books right now. Absolutely. We've also got the Joker 80th anniversary 100 page spectacular, which is hitting stores today. Numerous covers for that book. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen a publisher market one character as strongly during one period of time as DC Comics is going all in with the Joker. Joker's everywhere so much, Brian, he's on my t-shirt right now. But that's how, that's how big this character is. And, and this is no mystery, right? We've, we've featured Joker on this show before. And we've talked kind of about how this momentum was building. DC Comics has realized that this is the character for them to market. And, and it's weird because he's a villain. But his villainy, he, he has become so iconic beyond comics, within pop culture, um, as portrayed by so many amazing actors, that at this point, uh, this character is just beyond transcendent. So you're seeing it at your LCS right now. Like you mentioned, three Jokers available for pre-order right now from Jeff Johns. You've got the 80-page Spectacular in stores right now, giving you that origin of punchline. You've got Batman 92. You've got Nightwing 71, Joker War in stores again today. Lots to be excited for the Joker. And you just put the, the, the cherry on the top of the Sunday, mentioning the fact that we now found out that the Joker is coming to this Robert Pattinson trilogy, which is sure to be successful. We've seen that track record. Yeah, Joker's definitely at the top of the rogues, rogues gallery for Batman. And it's great because we know him as one character, but over the timeline of Joker's existence, you've seen him in different ways. You've seen him kind of more of a laughing character, always a villain, but you've seen him from different ways, from like way, way dark to, you know, kind of like just more of a, a hindrance. But either way, definitely hot right now. And the last one we have for the three-up portion this week is retailer exclusives. A lot of people, especially in the speculator community, talk about how they have this disdain for exclusives, but we're not here just to talk about speculators. We're always about integrity and community. That community reaches to the whole comic book hobby. We're talking about readers. We're talking about industry. We're talking about retailers. No doubt, retailers exclusives, whether you like them or hate them, they're talked about and they're hot. 
Yeah, so I know that this is not going to be a popular opinion amongst a um, portion of our community who has just an utter disdain for retailer exclusives. But I think that that number is dwindling. And this is something, Brian, that you and I are noticing. We just had a meeting prior to doing this uh, recording where this was one of the topics that we were discussing is the reality that as new collectors come into the market more and more, they are striving for exclusive limited collectibles. They're striving for unique variant art. They're striving for unique cover concept ideas. And they're not really concerned whether or not that's coming through main publishing, uh, direct market avenues, or through the exclusive variant market. We're seeing more and more uh, some of these iconic pieces of art. We just mentioned the last Ronin. How many different last Ronin variant covers have been shared throughout social media over the last couple of weeks? And it seems like one book keeps topping another. And then you have situations like the Peach Momoko uh, Frankie's Comics Yoda book, or the, uh, I think another Peach Momoko No Heroin book, or... Um, you know, uh, there's several out there on the market right now that are peaking above retail price by multiples of three and four. And that's not advocating that every single retailer exclusive is going to do that. But it is something that is a possibility and something that is being slept on right now. We're noticing a trend that more and more people are beginning to accept these as legitimate collectibles that are really artisan, organic, curated collectibles by a uh, retailer trying to deliver a product to the market that they feel like isn't being delivered through the traditional channels. And that is receiving more and more momentum. So I know that a portion of the audience is going to feel some sort of way and say they never, you know, they're not down with retailer exclusives and they're never going to be. And that's fine. You're entitled to that opinion. But unfortunately for you, I think that the, the newer collector is not sharing that sentiment and they're all about great artwork and limited print numbers. Not to mention when someone who doesn't like retailer exclusives, they might see a big two incentive variant and they see an artist on that book and they're like, wow, that's hot and that incentive variant is so great. They don't really, they may not realize that that artist got their break into the industry yeah. doing covers for store exclusives because it's hard to get in the industry. So that's the way they can get their cover out, get their art out, get recognized. Then they get picked up by these bigger publishers and then they're doing incentive variants, which is the ones that you like. Absolutely. That's what we're seeing is the big two, their, their entire recruitment strategy seems to be to use these retailer exclusive variants as a litmus test for which artists create buzz and demand. You're seeing Peach Momoko incentives everywhere, but first, before that, you saw Peach Momoko uh, exclusives. That's a prime example, and that has happened time and time again. You can go through from Art Germ to Shannon Mayer to anyone in between, uh, you know, Matina. That has been kind of the mode that we've seen. So there's our three up for this week, and we're going to move right now into some of those downward trends. Right now, we're starting with that Netflix series, Last Days of American Crime, and I think it's not doing too well. I watched it. Did you watch it, Brian? I didn't watch it. I saw the preview for it, but I've been watching reruns of The Office. All right. So there is a great movie within this movie. I think I would like, I have not, full disclosure, I've not read the comic, but I would love to read the Rick Remender comic. This movie to me was hot garbage. It was two and a half hours. There were sex scenes that played out for what felt like 10 minutes. There was conversations at a bar that played out for what felt like 10 minutes for just transitional stuff. I feel like you could cut 45 minutes to an hour off this movie and have a good movie. This movie to me was a director trying to showboat the entire time. Look at this fancy cut I can do. Look at this that I can do. Look at that that I can do. And it's a prime example of what can happen to a movie where the script may have been great. The, the graphic novel inspiration may have been great. But this movie was poorly, poorly, poorly contrived. And I'm not the only opinion like this. This is what you're seeing consistently. You're seeing the same comments. The movie's too long. There's too many boring parts. The director took too many kind of liberties rather than allowing this story that had incredible actors and was really a, a, a good heist story and had an amazing twist at the end that I didn't see coming. But it just got ruined by 45 minutes to an hour of fluff. So the reason why this is great to talk about, Brian, is we've often talked about the, the spec cycle or the retail, resale cycle. This is one where you don't want to hold a book till after the book comes out because you never, or the movie comes out because you never know how good the movie's going to be. And now that this movie's come out and it is trash, 
why would anyone pay premium prices for this book? This book is going to drop. And you could have sold this book probably two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and avoided all of this negative buzz. So if this is something you're keeping for your PC, that's a different story. But if you're looking at this from an investment or resale strategy, that is why we do not advocate you to wait till the last second. You know, trailers are great for resale. Um, you know, casting announcements are great for resale. But anytime that you wait for the movie to come out, you're running the risk of birds of prey, last days of American crime, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I would think the one caveat to that strategy is if you front sold a bunch of them and you've made your money, made your profit, and you're like, well, you know, I'm going to hold a couple back just to see. Yeah, yeah. Then that's Take a long shot. Right, right. Then you feel, you don't feel as bad taking the L on those two copies. But the next one I want to talk about on the downward trend, some people will probably say this hot because we've seen some sales on this right now, but we're going to talk about previews, previews catalogs as key issues of first appearances. Right. We're, this is one of the hottest topics in comics. And I got to be honest with you, full disclosure, Brian and I hate this. What? We are so serious. Guys. You're f***ing hot. Are you out of your minds? I'm playing bullshit. Um, we hate it for a few reasons. And I'll speak for myself, Brian. I, you know, you'll probably add in. Um, I, I hate it mainly because I actually see the value in somebody wanting to collect a true first appearance of a character. I think that they're unique and they're fun. And I think the, the uh, guy Topher who has kind of been credited for discovering a lot of these, who's been a contributor on the uh, Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. You've seen FOMO the puppet right here on, on, on Simpleman's Comics. Um, you know, I think he is very talented and I don't think he can always control what happens to the market after he makes some of these discoveries. But I think that this reaction to this book is insane. Prices right now are 325 to 350 for the Miles Morales book. Why would you pay so much more than what Ultimate Fallout 4 goes for? The first print. That to me is so, so, so silly. And it's one thing if we were looking at a preview where he, like, it was a preview of Ultimate Fallout. Miles Morales is not in the actual comic pages of the book. He is only on the cover. Traditionally, cover appearances don't even get credit as first appearances. But this is the cover of a free catalog. Where it's also problematic is a lot of stores get a lot of these catalogs for free and then just stick them in stock orders. And you've heard the argument, well, if they were going to get found, they would have been found by now. That's not true. You'll be surprised how many stores aren't as up on internet and apps. And or Diamond all themselves, previews themselves. Right, news story. Well, that brings up the other thing. Um, we're going we're gonna to omit names. Right, because you know we, these are not things that we know we've heard and been able to confirm. But we have been hearing things over the last couple of weeks involving previews. A lot of funny business. Um, we've heard about a owner of a website who sold a book at a high price, and then had his wife purchase the book. The phone number matched his phone number, so that then he could then inflate the price and then report it. We've heard about a YouTuber who acquired reportedly an entire case of these books because both diamond and previews were sitting on copies of these books. Um, again, whether those are true or not, the fact that those stories are out there is scary because that's something where if you're investing $300 in this book and the thought that a case could come out tomorrow um, that would devalue it is nerve wracking. We've also heard from a retailer who claims to have a case and wants to do something like give the books away. So that would tank the resale price of this. This is just a very dangerous proposition. Buy what you like, and if you wanna spend $300 on that book, by all means. But if you're coming here for collecting, investing, um, buying strategy advice, and you value Brian's in my opinion, I, I gotta tell you, this is, this is something we think is crazy. Um, this, is, this is social media hype. Um, these are not worthless books, but certainly not valued the way they are at this moment. Yeah, I mean, everything I say is just my personal opinion, but I think previews, if you're investing in previews as a first appearance, you're going to end up being left holding the bag because everyone's been talked, this is not like something that's new. Everyone's been talked about before where, oh, is previews a first appearance? And then we always talk about the market. The market ultimately decides that. No, it's not because it's just the preview of the character. That's like, I want to pay 
so much more money for the movie poster than actually go in and see the freaking movie, right? Right. Well, then where do we stop it, right? So we've seen Miles Morales and Spawn take off. What about the fact that like Walking Dead was on the cover of previews and preview pages were inside previews? Um, so is that the first appearance of Walking Dead? Should we be paying more for that book than Walking Dead number one? That's the kind of questions you have to ask yourself. I don't have a problem if people even paid $50 for this stupid Miles Morales preview book. But if you're choosing to buy that over, say, three copies of Ultimate Fallout 4, I don't even know what to tell you. Yeah, and then don't get butthurt if you send it in to get graded and it doesn't say first appearance of Miles Morales on it. Right, right. Or if, if one of these things that we're hearing um, from very reliable sources turn out to be true and suddenly um, the yeah, entire cases. market, yeah, if cases hit the market and the entire market collapses, um, you know, that, that is not unforeseen. So uh, be careful, uh, you know, be on the lookout. If you can grab one of those previews cheap at a store, if they're giving them away, if you can buy them for a few bucks, by all means, make that flip, do your thing. But I also worry about some of these guys selling these books for $300. We're going to end up getting returns in 20 days uh, looking for that money back. And that, that could be problematic. Like I said, that's just my personal opinion. We yep. always say buy what you like. So if you're fine with spending that amount of money on previews for that character, because you absolutely have to have it, by all means, do so and buy what you like. But the last one we're talking about on the three down this week is supply and demand, but not just the supply and demand itself, but the logic behind it. Yeah, a lot of misconceptions, Brian. And you know what really brought this to, to my attention? And you don't even know where I'm going to go with this yet, which is what I love. And that's where you guys get to see this live is Vigil. We're talking about Vigil again. That's where we are. We're talking about Vigil again. So we talked about this last week that Brian and I said the first appearance of Vigil um, and the first cover appearance coming in a second print, everybody's paying these high dollar prices for this character. And we're sitting there going, but the character wasn't real. It was a character in a dream by Matt Murdock. And we feel like people haven't read this book. And then when I started to get pushed back, people were like, well, they could bring him back. That was the first argument. Well, sure, they could bring anybody back. But they're less likely to bring him back a character who wasn't real than a character who was real. And even if they bring him back. It's a different person. It's a different person. Just look, and just look at Domino. Her first full appearance is X-Force 11. X-Force 8, she appears, but then later that's found to have been a dream sequence. So that book is not considered her first appearance. So there's already precedent to say why this would be good. But here's the new argument that we're hearing consistently is there's only 624 copies printed of this book. That's what people keep saying. Um, and that's where I feel like we did a little discussion about cameos and first appearances. I feel like we have to do a little discussion about supply and demand because I don't think people understand how this always works. People tend to equate supply and demand, meaning that the smaller the supply, the greater the demand for that book will be when that is not the case. If this character remains a dream and never comes back in comics, I don't care if there was only five of them. It's never going to be desirable. Every indie comic book would be a gold mine. Right. I don't think people realize that, Brian. I don't think people realize that, that some of these small press indie books are printed like 1,500 or 2,000 level. Um, and certainly many of them are still available for cover price. The, simply being uh, uh, low printed does not inherently mean that anything is collectible. Conversely, what do we always hear on the other side? And we talk about it on the top 10 show all the time. You bring up a book, you hear Oh, there's a million of that book printed. Again, how many were printed in Bronze Age? Doesn't matter because New Mutants 98 is in such demand, the price stays solid on that book. The and ASM if anything, 300. yeah, ASM 300, if anything, these books incrementally go up. They're blue chips. They don't go up large amounts, but they go up very small amounts slowly over time because the reality is while there may be a million billion of these things, they are the most in-demand comics in the market. And I would rather have a book printed with 800,000 copies that 2 million people want than a book printed with 600 copies that 100 people are trying to make a big deal on social media because that does not equal demand. So I agree. I understand that there's potential for demand if a book printed to 600 
has the same kind of interest as a book, 800,000 copies, sure. But the reason why that book was printed with 600 copies, Brian, nobody wanted. It was not ordered. Uh, the character was popular. And then the character died when we realized it didn't exist. And I, I really believe this character should stay a Reader Buzz character. It was a great story. Amazing Daredevil arc. Um, but one that should stay there. But I'm glad that we got to use that to be able to talk about the supply and demand economics. I feel free to, to accept any uh, criticism or uh, counterpoint in the comment section. We'd love to hear it. But uh, if, Or if you have any other examples where uh, all book is low printed but isn't in demand or book is high printed but isn't extreme demand, let us know in the comment section. Yeah, and, then, and that's what makes the conversation great. I mean, the people that defend that on the other side of it, they have valid points as well, and that's their collection. That's why we always say that's, that's your money. So if you feel that you got a book for value and you feel that book will be valued later on, that's why it's speculation because people don't know, right? Right, and I, and I don't begrudge anybody who has a differing opinion than us, Specific, even the people who argued this with us. Shout out to them. You know who you are. Um, it's just one of those things where, if you argue with me on Facebook, if you argue with me on Instagram, if you argue with me on Twitter, I'm going to bring it to Simpleman's Comics. That's what we do here. So that's, that's the beauty is uh, sometimes, man, the comments write the show. Right. And it's not, like I said, it's not in a begrudging way. That's no. what the conversation and that's what the hobby is about. So we enjoy those conversations with the people on Twitter, Facebook, yes. Instagram, and then even so in the comments, that's what makes the hobby so great. But there it is, guys. That's a three up, three down for this week putting last week's comments up on the screen. So do us a favor and comment what you think about this week. I'm sure we have some great comments because we covered some great topics. Let us know what you also think is hot right now. What do you think is cold? Where do you see market trends going? I know a lot of people are asking for DC Comics this week on that down portion. We all know for good reason why, but we keep it three and we keep it up and we keep it down. But either way, this is Brian Jack for Some Men's Comics. See you guys in the next video. Now, say it with your chest now, say it with your chest now.